so yes, my talk today is about optimizing for the beam and how can we make our programs run more efficiently on the virtual machine that we have. And I would like to start with a famous quote. Right? We all know the quote from Donald Knuth that premature optimization is the root of all evil. And if we consider that quote, the talk today wouldn't make any sense, right? Because we don't want to be evil after all. Uh, but we need to consider this quote in its entirety and not just this small excerpt. Because the quote in entirety says that we should forget about small efficiencies, say about 97% of the time, premature optimization is the root of, of, of all evil, yet we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%. And so this talk today is going to be about finding out where those 3% are, how can we, and then after we know them where they are, how can we make those 3% efficient. Uh, so, as it was said, I'm Michał Muskawa, and I look like that on the internet. So, if you're wondering why th there was some like young guy on the on the conference schedule, and it's me here, so uh, that's the same person. Uh, I'm on the Elixir and Ecto core teams, and you can find me on the internet in here. And I'm extremely. Uh, it's a great time to talk about optimizations on the Beam on the verge of release of OTP 21 because OTP21 has so many performance optimizations in it. Uh, and in, my, in, in tests that we did in, in the Elixir core team, like running mix compile on bigger projects with everything. So like starting the VM, compiling everything, reading files, writing files, is about 10 to 20% faster on OTP21 than on OTP20, which is a huge, huge difference. And if you want to have even more, be even more surprised by how much progress there is in performance in Erlang, try compiling a project that you had on Elixir 1.0 with OTP 17, right? Try compiling in with those versions, and then try compiling it again, compiling it again with Elixir 1.7 and OTP 21. It's like the difference is like, it's, it's so fast compared to one to another. And there is a lot of different things going on in 21. Is there's a compiler that it emits better code, and also the bytecode is packed more efficiently, so it uses less memory and fits better into cache. Monitors were optimized, links were optimized, files were optimized, I.O. Uh, subsystem was rewritten completely, so there's a lot, a lot of interesting things going on. And before we go into the meets, right, we, I want to talk also about why performance matters, right? Why do, should we care about performance of our applications? And so one reason is that like, it will use less resources and we we'll, could buy cheaper servers, but for most companies that's not really an important factor. Uh, but what is, what, uh, there are other factors that, f uh, that are affected by performance of the application, and one of them is, for example, if your application is slower, Google will rank it lower in the search results, right? Also, Amazon did uh, some research uh, at one point uh, when they concluded that about 100 milliseconds of delay in the page, in the load speed of a page, means 1% re re revenue lost for them, right? So the performance has a very direct cor correlation with uh, with uh, the healthy of like with with money, right? And how well companies are are doing. And the last point is that there's a lot of benchmark on the internet comparing various languages between them, right? And showing off in those benchmarks is a good way to attract new people to the community. Uh, it's not a very important uh, factor, but it's also something that uh, that's, is a nice result of, of optimizing the, the libraries and, and the virtual machine. Uh, so the way I started with all of those, right, with the optimization, a lot of the work I did, was I looked at le leaks, lex, I have no idea how to pronounce it, so, but the, the lexer compiler library for, for Erlang, and it operates on, uh, on uh, char lists, right? I wondered, how would it work if it operated on binaries instead? Uh, so I built it, <laughs> of course, that's what you do. Uh, and it's about 20% faster and uses twice, uh, twice or even three times uh, as l less memory than the, the, the original, 
right? And also leverages Elixir macros, so you have this nice DSL for defining it and not a separate thing. And with that, I started looking at various things like disassembling code, looking at disassembly, looking at Elixir functions. Uh, and in many cases, I said, like, that makes no sense to do it like that, right? I started rewriting it, optimizing, contributing to one another, and like one thing led to another, and I started doing it more and more and more. And the final result of all of this is a JSON library that I wrote, because writing a JSON library is also something that you do. Uh, Everybody has one, right? Uh, and this library, uh, the, the main focus of the library was exactly performance. Uh, and it is twice as fast as the other Elixir. So Poison, the, the, the like leading Elixir uh, JSON library. But when it is compiled with Hype, it's even faster than Jiffy, which is implemented in C, right? So this is, uh, uh, I think this, is, uh, this achieved the, the goal. Uh, and so yeah, with all of that out of the way, the introductions, uh, I'd like to talk about the how should we approach optimizing the programs, right? Because we shouldn't just go into and start like writing things to make them faster. Because first we need to find those three percents, right? And this is the first part is measure. Then we should learn about how do we uh, approach uh, our code, how the virtual machine works, how do we make it. Uh, how do we integrate better with it? And then we need to rewrite our code and measure it's actually faster. And so the first part, I would say, is that we need to know we have a performance problem, right? Because if we don't know that, like, we don't know even we need to start. Uh, not even we don't know where to start, but we don't even know we need to start. And I think, like, Observer is a great tool. Like, it's built in, it's simple, but it's, it has a lot of potential to discovering some uh, issues. And then there's also Wombat, so the, the commercial product from Erlang Solutions it has some, uh, some integrations. Uh, but there are also two great tools, which is Observer CLI, which, like the name suggests, gives you a CLI version of Observer, and Wobserver, which is like the web-based Observer. Uh, and I have some screenshots of how it looks like. So basically everything you have in your regular observer, you can get in the browser. Uh, and that's how the, the observer CLI looks like. Uh, right? So once we uh, have monitoring uh, configured and we know that we have some performance problem, then we need to measure where exactly, right? We need to profile our code to discover where the performance issue is. And when it comes to pr uh, profilers on the, uh, in Erlang, we have three that are built in, which are cprof, fprof, and eprof. And they do v various level of, of profiling. cprof is like the lowest overhead, but also gives you the least information, because o it only gives you the number of how many times this function was called, how many times each function was called eprof gives also times, and fprof does an extensive analysis, but it's also pretty high overhead. Uh, another tool that I would like to show is xprof, uh, which is a web-based tool for profiling based on tracing. Uh, and so it looks like that. You get a prompt where you can type in uh, basically a, a match spec, so in the, in the uh, something like uh, um, Recon style match spec for tracing the functions, and then it graphs all the results of how those uh, how those traces look like, and it's designed to be used uh, on on production systems. And as a last point, I wanted to mention like the the mix integrations with the various profilers, uh, which like print it in the Elixir syntax and and all of that. Uh, yeah. So once we know where exactly our problem is, and hopefully the profilers sh should show us that. Then when we write our new version of the code, an old version of the code, we need to somehow compare them one against the other. And we could use the profilers again, but it's pretty inconvenient to, write the whole to run the whole program just to, take to, to measure changes in one part. And that's where we come to micro benchmarking. Uh, which is we want to benchmark just one single function and see how it uh, how it does, 
And here I can recommend uh, two tools, uh, one in Elixir, one in Erlang. So the Erlang one, a mini stat, uh, does an extensive statistical analysis of the results uh, and helps you understand how this, uh, how the, the, the function you're benchmarking is behaving exactly. Uh, the Elixir tool uh, does a bit less of statistical analysis, but has more flashy features, as Elixir tools do. Uh, so it generates some HTML graphs and, and things like that, which is also pretty useful, right? Because you get a, a nice graph that you can look at. I have some examples of, of how the, the reports look, look like, uh, right? So you can immediately see how things compare uh, one to another. And when we're talking about benchmarking, there's one very important part, point. Don't benchmark in the shell. Shell is not running the regular Erlang code as it is compiled. Shell is running an interpreter. So the performance characteristic on wa of one versus the other is very, very different. Right? And I would say the last tool in my toolbox for optimizing programs uh, is disassembling them. Right? So when I'm trying to optimize uh, sequential parts of, of the programs, right? I would just dump the, the raw uh, assembly, look at it, how it compares one to another, and if there are some things that could be eliminated and could be made faster. Uh, and to do that, in Erlang, it's very easy, because the, the Erlang compiler has like the two ASM flag that you can pass, and it will spit, it, spit out the, the assemb assemble the file compiled to assembly. Uh, with Elixir, it's a bit more complex, because of how Elixir compiler works, uh, but we were able to, uh, I wrote a tool <laughs> to decompile an already, or already compiled Elixir module, and so you can decompile it to assembly, but you can also decompile it to Elixir after expanding all the macros, or uh, equivalent Erlang for the, the Elixir module, and some intermediate compiler uh, formats. And an important thing to understanding what you're reading when you decompile pro the program, I would say that the Beam book is a great resource because it describes the, the instructions and in general how the, the Beam works. And that's when we come to the next part of the talk, which is understand the Beam, right? So in order to optimize those programs, we need to know how the code is executed. Right? How the virtual machine executes our code, so we can uh, fit better, uh, be a b uh, make the code a better fit for the particulars of the of the, the beam. And I have to warn you, uh, the talk was marked as expert, so I have no worries about showing assembly on screen in a minute. <laughs> like I hope nobody will run screaming from the room. If if you feel like you want to, please limit the screams. <laughs> Uh, and one important point about the beam, which makes it different from most commercial virtual machines out there, is that it is a register-based uh, machine and not a stack-based machine. And what does this mean? If we look at the, this is like a simplification of like how does adding things work, right? So in a stack machine, uh, we have the the function, uh, the the data stack, right, with uh, with elements on it. Right? So, for example, we have two numbers, and when we, we issue one add instruction without any arguments, and it takes the two topmost things from the stack, adds them, and puts the result on the stack. Right? And the part that it, uh, the instruction acts on the two topmost elements is very important, because if the elements are not on the top, you need to shuffle the stack, you need to rearrange, uh, rearrange it, so it so you can access the elements underneath. On the other hand, the add, in add instruction does not need any arguments, so it is small. Right? In the register machine, instead of having this data stack where we put the data and take it from and, and take it take the data from and put it back again, we have registers, uh, and we and each instruction, like this add instruction, also has arguments where it should take the data from and where it should write the result. Right? So, for example, in here we have an illustration of how it works when we have add with uh, registers 1 and 2 as arguments, and as result should be register 3. Right? 
and there's no reason why we shouldn't couldn't work on register four and three and put the result in register one. Right? There's much more flexibility at the expense of much bigger instructions because we need to include the addresses of like where the data should come from and where should it be stored. Uh, and yeah, now we'll look at some examples uh, of the, the uh, assembly. Uh, and I don't want you to like internalize how the assembly works. That's not the point. The point I would want to make in this part uh, is actually understanding the various techniques Beam uses underneath and how they translate to code uh, and how they, they affect the, the performance of things. And so we start with very simple, uh, it's a bit unfortunate I have code at the bottom, but I'm sorry about that. Uh, that's a simple addition, right? And you can see from that that arguments of a function, which have argument A and B, uh, and we have the multiplication and uh, multiplication and addition. Uh, oh yeah, I have the pointer. So we have multiplication and addition, and you can see that B as a second argument is implicitly located in register X1, and A as a first argument is implicitly located in, in register X0. So this means that uh, so arguments, as they arrive to a function, are placed in the registers sequentially, right? And the return value, so the result of the whole computation in here, is placed in the register x0. And that's another property of the beam, that the result of the function should be placed in register x0. That's the contract of functions, right? And we can see in here that exactly, th so the multiplication operation specifies all the operators and it not only can specify uh, argument as a, uh, as a register, but it can also specify a literal argument, which we in here we have an integer, 5. Uh, and the next important thing is how stack works and how tail recursion works. Right? Because this, this is an important part of optimizing uh, programs, is understanding s uh, tail recursion. And so, the way uh, the, the so I, I just talked about stack machine and register machine and that we don't have a stack, right? And now I'm telling you that we do have a stack, but it's a different stack, right? Uh, so the stack machines have two stacks, right? One is function stack, one is data stack. And we talked about how data flows through the data stack. But functions, when you call a function, you have an entry to the stack to hold information for that function. So you know where to return from that function once you're finished. And something very similar is needed in here. Once when we enter a function, we need to save when we, where we need to return from that function, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't know that. Uh, but the, the interesting thing is that this management is very explicit, right? So when we enter a function and we need to allocate stack, right? So we have some operations where we need to remember where we need to return we allocate a stack frame, and then before returning from the function, we deallocate the stack frame. Right? So this management is entirely manual as far as the, the, the bytecode is concerned. Uh, right? And interesting thing is in here, so mm, yeah, let's look in here. When we call a function, right, we move all the arguments in the correct places, so we need to arrange arguments so the first argument is in the register x0, the second in x1, and all of that, then we call a function, and here is like the identity function, it just returns, right? Because the first argument is already in the right register, so we, can, we need to just return from the function. Uh, but we can skip returning from a function, and instead of returning, we can continue the computation into another function. And this is exactly how tail recursion is implemented in Erlang, right? So in here we have, the difference is that we wrapped the, the the, our test function in another identity and in the bottom instead of returning we see this call last instruction which instructs the, the virtual machine to deallocate the stack and then call the function, continue into the function rather than explicit calls and this means we're not growing the stack right? because in here where we're calling the functions we needed to allocate the stack, call the function so the stack is bigger when we enter the function and then 
once the function returns, we only deallocate the stack. But in here, we call the function after deallocating the stack, so the stack does not grow. Uh, and also an interesting uh, thing that uh, is implemented in the beam and is made possible thanks to the immutability of Erlang uh, is how it deals with literals. And what I mean with literals is basically any data structure that is literal in your code, right? that is put as a value itself is not computed while it's written down in the, in the source code. And in the disassembly for this function, you can see that this data is not constructed in this function. It's not allocated inside this function. Right? The function has only an instruction, move a literal and the whole value. Right? And because our, uh, all the data is immutable, uh, we can just allocate this data once when the module is loaded, and then every single time the function is executed, we can reuse the same data. We can just return a pointer to this data that was allocated just once. And this makes uh, it possible uh, to do many other uh, interesting things and decreases the memory of the programs significantly. Uh, yes. And the, I think the last interesting part of that that I would like to talk about is how integer matching is implemented in the beam, right? Because if we would wanted to implement this function naively, right, we would have, so let's take the x, right, and if it's zero, we retain this. If one, return that. If two, return this, right? But it's pretty inefficient as, an uh, as a way to, to implement it, right? So the beam has a special instruction called select val, uh, which selects, uh, which takes one argument, so in, in this case the first uh, argument of our function, and selects between several possible values and jumps, does a jump to a several possible results of doing this, uh, this selection. Uh, and in case of integers, when all your integers are continuous, there's an even further optimization done when you load the module, that instead of doing this evaluation one by one by one, it's actually turned into a jump table. So basically selecting between them is a single, uh, single instruction very fast uh, to do that. And this is something I rely heavily on in the JSON library. Right? Every time we need to select on a byte, I design it in a way that it does this jump table uh, optimization. Uh, so that was the, I think, the hard part of the talk. I think half of you sl are sleeping. <laughs> uh, so in here, there are some smaller tips that you can use in your programs day to day. Uh, so the first one is specifically Elixir, is inlining functions using macros. Uh, this is used very extensively in Elixir. Uh, this is, for example, uh, part of implementation of how uh, parsing of integers is implemented, right? Uh, so we can do basically iterate it through all the pairs of the characters in different bases, right? And we can generate the functions on the fly for us, right? We can do exactly the same in, in Erlang, either writing it all down manually or having some preprocessor. Uh, but this is something where uh, Elixir allows to, to make some, some nice performance uh, optimizations uh, that are, I would say, like cumbersome to do in, in Erlang. Uh, not impossible, but cumbersome. And uh, code like that is actually pretty common in, uh, in many cases uh, in Elixir, that there are functions generated dynamically from some data. Uh, and another thing is that, uh, so initially the parsing in Elixir was implemented how you would naively implement a parsing, right? So you go through every byte, check it's a valid integer, and then multiply the accumulator by that base and add the result, uh, and sequential like that. But after the, the optimization, so the way it works right now is that it basically counts how many digits are in the binary, then takes just the digit, digits, right, and delegates to the binary to integer bif 
which is very fast at what it does. Uh, so this is the point of delegate to the virtual machine, right? When you can, because it does the operations that are built in are usually pretty well optimized. And an interesting point is also reuse the data if you haven't modified it. So this is how uh, Elixir has keywords, which are similar to prop lists uh, in Erlang. And this is how a deleting a key from the keyword was implemented right, for a long time. So you basically go through the list and filter all the keys uh, that are different than the key we want to reject. right? And we return a new keyword list. And this is great, but it has one problem. If the key is not there, we'll return a new list every single time. And this is, and this does not seem like much, but because Erlang has this uh, features of sharing, right, and the literals, right, it might be that doing this, we're turning our literal that we had before into a dynamically allocated data, right? And so the new implementation, as you can see in here, it first checks if the key is present in the keyword, and only if it is, it actually deletes it. Right? So it could seem that this is more expensive beca because we need to traverse the list twice now. Uh, but it turns out that unrolling the, the list's filter call and the function into like manual recursion makes it so much faster that it's even with the additional list's key member call, it's still twice as fast as the previous implementation. And in case the key is not there, it's like, depending on the size of the list, it's infinitely fa it's faster. Right? Uh, and uh, uh, at when this was contributed to Elixir, uh, there was uh, an evaluation uh, that in a, like a regular Phoenix request, about I think 80% of the calls to delete were actually misses, right? So they weren't deleting anything, right? So this. Uh, is pretty uh, common and comes back a little bit to the point I said about measuring, right? So it sometimes makes sense to make some part slower if it's not the common thing that you're doing. And the last point uh, is processing binaries in chunks. Uh, last or like, yeah, previous to last. Uh, so a reg the regular way how you would process binaries, right? You would iterate through them and then append to a result byte after byte. The problem is that this is uh, not uh, very efficient because you're basically modifying the, the result binary on every single iteration, right? And it's pretty, uh, uh, it, it's well optimized inside the, the virtual uh, machine, but it's still slower than what we can do instead. And that is instead of copying the bytes one from another and then just changing every once and, uh, and again. For example, imagine a down case function, right? So the way you would implement it, if it's already down cased, you don't do anything, right? Just copy it to the output. And if it's upper cased, you down case it and then copy to the output the, the down case result. But what you can do instead is going through the results, just count how many already down cased elements you have, and then extract a sub binary from the original with the downcased elements, right, and build uh, it that way, right, with chunks of the data that you're not changing. And here is a very extensive example I won't go th into that does this for HTML escaping, right? But this is the, the idea that instead of g copying everything byte by byte, you look through chunks that you can skip entirely and, and not copy. And one tip for the Erlang guys, throw away dict. Like it's slower than maps, uses more memory than maps, and you cannot read it in the shell. Like uh, it has no uh, advantages at that point to maps. Uh, so yeah, just use maps. And uh, prefer bifs to functions. Many things in the, you can do many operations in the virtual, in the, in Erlang, uh, an elixir, you can do two ways. You can either call a function or you can go call a guard beef or some syntax or something. And in general, I would recommend to prefer the syntax or the beefs uh, because of how uh, they are implemented in the in the VM. 
there are in single instruction instead of the whole function call where we need to set up the stack and all of that, arrange the arguments in correct order and do all of that. Right? So some example of that is, for example, the binary part function instead of the binary part guard beef, or the maps get instead of pattern matching, or the new guard uh, called map get uh, that will be introduced in 21, or maps put instead of like the syntax to putting something in the maps. Uh, if you have hot loops, this does actually actually uh, matter. And the last part of the talk is dreaming about the future, as I promised in the abstract. Uh, so what optimizations Beam could do in the future uh, that could be quite interesting? And I think the most interesting one for me is tail call modular cons. And the idea is basically that given a function like that, right, which is normally is not tail recursive, right? It's a body recursive function. But there is a way to transform this function into a tail recursive function uh, without reversing at the end. That's the important bit, right? So inside the VM, it would use mutable lists uh, uh, to do this, uh, but this will be hidden from the user. Uh, and this is something that's possible. There's liter literature, literature on how to do that. Uh, and I think this could be something very interesting because code like that is extremely common uh, in, in Erlang and, and Elixir, where you build your lists like that. Uh, another idea is use uh, those interesting processor instructions that process multiple data, multiple, uh, uh, yeah, there's process more data in a single instruction. Uh, and there's a recent, uh, uh, pull requests from uh, Jose that optimizes the binary match function uh, from 10% to 70 times, right? Exactly using those, uh, those instructions uh, because they, they can process more data uh, at once. Instead of going byte by byte, we can jump like whole sections of bytes when we're looking for a pattern. And there are more uh, ideas where this could be leveraged but it needs to be uh, closely examined. And now we're entering the crazy ideas part. Uh, so the idea is to change how linked lists look. And because very often in the programs, we get the lists reverse calls, right? And it builds a regular linked list, right? But what if it could return an array instead? And we could transparently interface, like arrays, use arrays as if arrays in that there is a continuous memory, uh, like linked lists. And this idea is called unrolled linked lists, and it's also, also like talked in the in the literature. I think this could be uh, something interesting to explore as well. And uh, another idea is there is this. Uh, the Erlang library, the, the, the Mochi web, had this module called Mochi Global that basically compiled your uh, configuration or your dynamic data into modules. So it's placed in the literal, uh, as, so it's treated as literals, uh, which I talked before. And this, there's a library from uh, in, in Elixir based on this idea called Fast Global. Uh, so this idea comes every now and, and again uh, so the thing I would propose in here is maybe figure out a way to do this explicitly in the code instead of like dynamically compiling modules, give an API to do that, right? And uh, I th the, the last idea is having multiple returns from a function. So instead of returning tuples and allocating a tuple where you return, because we saw that return, I return returning value is in the register x1, right? But when we're returning a tuple, couldn't we return like the first element in x1, the second element in x, uh, x2, third in x3, and stuff like that, right? And this could save us an allocation of a tuple uh, and could be also uh, quite uh, interesting. 
and that's everything I had for you today.